First of all, I take the opportunity to thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, give me the possibility to present our data. As you can see here, these are real life experiences I want to transport and I start with the acknowledgement to um, all these physici physicians, more doctors than patients probably I will report on, but uh, we have had um, opportunity to participate in the licensing study of Novartis and I come back to that later as the only center in Germany for treating patients with ALL and so um, we appreciate the cooperation with many physicians for referring their patients. So these are my disclosures here, not all are relevant um, for this presentation. So as I mentioned, so we have had the uh, possibility and the privilege to participate in this licensing study with regard to the application of this gene, like Loisel, um, of uh, Novartis, and Stefan Grapp has um, updated these results at the last ESH meeting. What is important, what were uh, inclusion criteria into that trial, and it is not only that the relevant ones are patients who are primary refractory or with a refractory relapse, patients with a second relapse, a relapse after allergenic transplantation and the patient should have been at least in a good clinical condition to bridge a few months till the CAR T-cell application was possible. Patients need a bridging therapy between the apheresis and CAR T-cell treatment and this lasts, as I mentioned, sometimes several months. So they should not have to be in a complete remission. And then, besides of this, there were two more pages of inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, uh, accurately defining the risk profile of the patients who could be included. The results of the licensing trial has been published this year in 2018, and you do know the results about it, very promising results for this high risk uh, group and cohort of patients uh, without any doubt. So, and um, these results were then, and you heard about it and you know it, the basis for the uh, approval of the EMA uh, in Europe last year. And uh, now it's my privilege now to report on our experience. We have in, made in Frankfurt first on the Eliana trial, where we could include six patients in the extended access program, which uh, followed the licensing Iliana trial, where again we could include six patients and then since um, the drug is commercially available, we have treated 11 patients and um, it's not uh, totally correct. As you can see here that two patients were treated in Munich in the University Medical Center and one in the Van Hauna Children's uh, Hospital and I'm grateful to Monika Sukklevi and Tobias Feuchtinger that they uh, um, brought their patient data to this presentation. So from the 23 patients, seven have a diagnosis of a pre-BALL and uh, 16 of a common ALL and the age you can see here, median age was 16.7 years and the youngest patient was 1.1 year and the oldest lady was 33 years old. Uh, why could that be happen? Because she has uh, started a, a first diagnosis of her leukemia when she was 12 years old and uh, uh, almost 20 years uh, career of her leukemia and she could be included in the trial. The median body weight is 53 kilos and this is important and you can see here our, um, the youngest patient one year was 8 kilos, so this is technically not always easy to generate uh, aphoresis. The C status, again, first refractory relapse in one patient, uh, second uh, relapse refractory, then two patients, primary refractory, upfront diagnosis and Eight, um, and um, 19 patients, 19 patients relapsed after first allergenic transplantation. So how did the aphoresis uh, went? So all um, 23 patients underwent aphoresis and um, however only 20 out of 23 reached the, uh, the goal number of cells, 2 times 10 to the 9 and the total nucleated cells and 1 times 10 to the 9 CD3 positive cells, 3 patients, 8 kilos, 21 and 65, 
did not reach the uh, goal number uh, um, the first time, so they underwent a second aphoresis. Uh, and um, finally, um, the, um, and then the aphoresis was sent to the transduction, and 18 out of 23 patients uh, um, achieved um, a successful transduction up front. In two patients, a second aphoresis was necessary, and you can imagine what that means. So you have to time the slot and the production and then the second slot. So sometimes it took four, five months for these two patients till they got the information as the aphoresis could be used or not. In uh, one out of 23 patients, uh, the production number of cells was all right, but the, uh, um, they nevertheless did not meet the release criteria. They are out of specification, but uh, due to the cooperation of the company, and it was possible to uh, um, give these cells in an out of specification procedure. And in two out of 23 patients, the uh, transaction was not successful. So from the enrolled patients in the intention to treat population, three um, did not receive the cells, two for the transduction failure, and in one patient the disease progression was too rapid and um, he died when the cell arrived in the institution. So finally 20 patients uh, were transfused. So from the time of aphoresis till the production of the cells, um, we are treating the patients with a low-dose chemotherapy, which could be done on an outpatient, um, outpatient basis with uh, oral drugs, dexamethasone for the in induction, either rubicin and uh, vincristine. And uh, we have published uh, this uh, attempt how we uh, treat uh, patients with a relapse after allergenic transplantation, Andre Villas. And you can see here this lymphodepletion allows a control of the leukemia and in some times really a re-induction and induction of remission and you see this in a second. So prior to lymphodepleting chemotherapy, patient received 18 this type of maintenance treatment. Two could not be controlled by that and received in addition in a tuzumab before so that patient's status at uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy. So four of them were already in complete remission and even MRD negative. Two of them have had uh, a CNS involvement at time of, um, and at time of um, inclusion. Uh, four patients were in complete remission but measurable uh, residual disease. One patient with an incomplete uh, uh, remission but MRD positive and 11 patients were in non-remission at the time lymphodepleting chemotherapy started. Here I just want to give you one example, not the dramatic one. So I could show you samples where patients developed a substantial CRS, but this patient, um, a young girl with a second relapse after allergenic transplantation, she was in remission again at the time of lymphodepletion MRD positive. So she received the CAR T cell infusion here at day zero, and then you can see a gradual expansion of T cells, although not that high towards day six. And you see the um, IL-2 receptor increase, but not dramatic, and uh, you see no elevation of IL-6. So um, here another figure. So with the infusion of the CAR T cell, no temperature rise, uh, ferritin just a little bit increased, no C-reactive protein, but nevertheless at day 14 and at day uh, 37 the patient showed substantial expansion of the CAR T cells in the peripheral blood, 7.5% and 4.3% and the patient clearly developed MRD negativity. Adverse event, we did observe this, but interestingly, at the very beginning of the study, more substantial uh, in patients um, with uh, CRS um, in two patients, CRS and CRAS and uh, encephalopathy syndromes in three patients. One patient showed only a, a CRAS symptomatic. The severity you see grade four in three patients, this was at the very beginning, and later on when the patient did respond to the treatment and entered the 
uh, CAR T cell application while being uh, MRD positive only, so the severity decreased and it was the same CRESS syndrome uh, seizures in three patients and this uh, have been substantial uh, problems which need uh, appropriate treatment. So what was the response at last, um, at last follow up? So from the patients um, who were in remission already at lymphodepleting chemotherapy, these are the nine patients, all nine uh, became and remained MRD negative during the follow up. From the patients who were not in remission, these were the 11 patients, finally seven of them are alive, five in complete remission and two after relapse, I'll come back to that later, and four died. Um, two with a non-response and two directly in a progression ortho the application of the CAR T cells. So, from the 20 patients infused, seven relapsed so far, 14 were in complete remission, one is alive after a second transplantation after relapse, one is alive with relapse at the moment, Three died due to relapse disease and one patient unfortunately died in remission due to infection and also here the time from inclusion to treatment probably was the issue. So this is the intention to treat analysis. This is important because we have to, can, uh, to uh, consent and to, to guide our parents and patients what might be the best treatment. So from all 23 patients at six months there was a 64% survival and um, event and overall survival and we have a look to these patients who finally received the treatment. So um, that is uh, excellent after one year. It's uh, 60, uh, uh, some, uh, some above 60%. And we have a look to the disease status before lymphodepleting chemotherapy. So those who did respond to the low-dose chemotherapy, they also had an excellent response to CAR T-cell treatment. And the patients who did not respond, some of them were extremely refractory. They did poor. And uh, that's clear also the same picture for the overall survival. And clearly the number of patients are too small to uh, really um, consider this substantial. But what I want to focus is what we did observe in two patients here. And this is, you can see the CAR T cells and leukemia cells in the peripheral blood um, under the microscope. And these are really expanded CAR T cells and I'm really curious what the specialists are saying to this. Huh? So let's say these are 2,000 T cells and 20% CAR T cells and the same amount of blast beside each other and these were in two patients. They really came with the CAR T cells and the blasts and the blasts again. I thought, okay, this is not probably an issue of the CAR T cells. They are functioning and um, also not the interaction to them to the leukemia cells because we gave them uh, uh, PDL1 inhibitors and we did not see any lysis of the blast. So I think so there are cells and factors we did not really talk about today is if the car meets the leukemia cell, how really goes the killing? So and in my understanding, a lot of that is uh, induced by the application and the perforin and granzymes which are put into the uh, leukemia cells and then the apoptosis mechanisms has to start and if we do have resistances here, let's say by a caspers 9, defi 9 deficiency or that our anti-apoptotic factors are, are too potent, then we have uh, intrinsic resistance to apoptosis and probably the leukemia will survive the CAR T cells as clinatumab, as different chemotherapeutic agents. So my conclusions for today are, yes, we did observe a high efficacy in patients who received the CAR T cells with regards to induction of remission, maintenance of remission, durable uh, complete remissions were observed. The longest in our cohort is three years with persisting uh, CAR T cells and MRD negative. 
CIS was manageable and it was less likely than initially and less, uh, less, frequent, less frequent than in the overall trial. It was manageable. We did not observe death due to refractory CRS or, or CRAS syndromes. This, the latter, however, is sometimes challenging and uh, this could mimic uh, CNS infections and sometimes you have both. So I could show very interesting case reports about that. We, from the clinical point of view, have decided uh, after our first uh, uh, three substantial um, seizures that we uh, do uh, anticonvulsive prophylaxis. Uh, CIS was, in our experience, dependent of, on the disease load prior to the lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Majority of safety events occurred within the first eight weeks. CAR T cells, they do offer clearly a new option for pediatric young adult um, patients with relapsed and maybe also this really refractory BALL, but here uh, it needs to be improved. What we do not know, however, and Andre, you um, discussed about this, what is the optimal place of the CAR T cell treatment? I think this is much upfront and not in these, in these very uh, in patients at the end stage possibilities of their, of their disease. But these uh, studies need to be done in a controlled fashion. So, at the very end, I am really grateful to uh, our dedicated team in Frankfurt. This is a picture of our pediatric transplant and cell therapy unit. And I am grateful uh, for the, um, to the colleagues who referred their patients um, to us for the treatment. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Peter. And I have already mentioned by Claudia now the three presentations are open for discussion. And uh, if there is any question, maybe I can start. Uh, uh, Peter and Andre, what's the median time between uh, the ferritic collection and the DRAPRAD release uh, in your commercially available setting? In the commercial available setting, it's quite short, between three and four weeks. So from the um, aphorasis to the delivery of the product. So this in the study, it was more complicated because often we have only reduced slots available. So this is my experience. And did you wait uh, for available slots? Or uh, once that you asked the request, there were slots immediately available? Because in a certain way, it invests the issue of uh, the drug product manufacturing overall. Mm -hmm. Clearly, this is a very important question. That's a critical issue. Slots needs to be there because um, you um, may also face a failure of the production and then the time span is too long. The risk of these critical ill patients is too substantial. Yeah. It's true that the manufacturing process does not describe the full length of the vein-to-vein -vein, uh, circuit of the patient because sometimes you receive the drug, but finally your patient is either evolving or something else, and you cannot infuse the cell. We have experimented also the shortening of the, of the manufacturing process and the, let's say, from door to door delivery of the product, according to what Peter says, around four weeks. But it, and basically I would say we are more in the six weeks from vein to vein, then to four weeks vein to vein. But those, those six weeks also help to decrease the load of, of the disease with mild chemotherapy. So please. So thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding a patient uh, who received CAR T cells after allergenic transplantation. Have you looked at the chimerism of lymphocyte T and uh, before uh, at the collection and after we, we we have and it it's i don't remember any patient without full chimerism so the cells we take after relapse for after transplant 
are cells from the donor. Do you think there is a difference in uh, efficacy? Uh, at the moment, Shannon produced data which doesn't see where the, the, in the Eliana trial and also in the Philadelphia data, there are no differences between those relapsing after ALO and those without ALO. So it's not uh, allogenic per se, it's not a super DLI, if you okay. want. No my, uh, no, my question is just uh, looking at the allo patient between those with full chimerism and those with mixed or uh, autolog type. I, I cannot remember a patient in partial chimerism here. Do you? Now this, in fact, were late relapses, so the leukemia was outlo was uh, outlogus definitely, and um, okay, but I have um, I have not the data in all patients on the chimerism of the subpopulations, which would be interesting, yeah, but definitely the T cells, the T cells here, they were of donor origin, yeah. Oh, please. Okay, a question for you, Professor Locatelli. Thank you for sharing your very exciting results in neuroblastoma. Um, very interesting to see this nice antitumor activity, which wasn't so evident in the previously used 14G2A based CAR T cell studies, for example, those published uh, by Baylor. I was just wondering what your thoughts were about what the differences may be. Did you use a lentiviral vector, for example, or are the other differences obvious? So thank you for asking. Uh, no, we use a retroviral platform. Uh, uh, the difference is that possibly, uh, of course, it's a speculation that we use a third generation car combining CD28 and 41BB. And uh, the choice of this combination was the result of a very long uh, experimental study because uh, we compare several combinations of co-stimulatory domains and this combination was that associated with uh, le the less expressed exhaustion profiling. Thank you. Just two small questions. One, can we collect the cells from the donor in the patients that have the relapse after an mutation to use the donor the first transplant is a source of the expanded cells. And the second one is in the patients that are transplanted after uh, the CAR T cells, what happens to the CAR T cells? So the first question, uh, very important one. So I think it's not possible to um, use the stem cell donor for the transaction of the CAR T cells because there will also be always be cells in which are not transduced and even if the transduced they have the T cell receptor and will be able to induce GVHD. So the reason why we can use the donor T cells out of the patient is because they have become tolerant and do not induce GVHD and that's the reason why for example um, you could not use these cells to, if the transplant is only 30, 40, 60 days yep. away because then this tolerance induction still has not occurred so that is, uh, that's not possible and sorry the second question what happens to the CAR T cells after you transplant after the Okay, so I suppose they have been begun, but um, I have no experience here. Yes, they are gone. If you transplant a child after uh, given CAR T cells, they are destroyed by conditioning regimen. Going back to the question of uh, the transduction uh, efficiency, may I ask to both of you which was the percentage of transduced cells uh, in your patients that you presented? Okay, so, Please. Andre, no, no, no. <laughs> Please, my dear. So, um, we don't know this in, in detail. Huh? You are referring to the black box, basically. <laughs> Any further questions from the audience? I have another question um, regarding the lack of disease at the time of lymphodepletion that seems to be predictive of good outcome in the relapse refractory setting. 
not only in your um, cohorts, but also in other studies. And at the same time, in the study groups at present, we're discussing the best preparative regimen, the best induction chemotherapy for patients with a full-blown first relapse prior to CAR T cells in comparison to allotransplant. And we believe that other than in the transplant setting, we don't need minimal residual disease levels or even lack of disease um, prior to CAR T cells. And there are voices um, saying that we just need a mild induction and don't care if the patient's remission or not. CAR T cells will do the trick. And there are others who say that something as effective at inotulizumab that um, simply gets the patient into MRD negative remission, which will not last as we know, is the better way to prepare for CAR T cell therapy to get good long-term outcome. Could you speculate what you think is the best way? So how I do see this, it's not a question of the quantity, the MRD, yeah, the level, so, but it's MRD here is a surrogate parameter for the biological behavior of the leukemia. This is my interpretation. And therefore, those who respond and induce a complete remission with this little um, uh, chemotherapy, two, three, four doses of Christine and two doses of uh, either rubicin um, and a low dose of uh, um, steroids. So this is, would be only temporary, but they are responding well, and so therefore they could be brought into apoptosis, sorry for saying this so, quite easily yeah, by the, the impulses given by the cars. And uh, for patients who do not respond, they are refractory, they have intrinsic resistant mechanisms. So I think probably it might be enough to bring that below a border of, let's say, 5% with a low dose chemotherapy. The data you uh, present. Alter alternatively, please. I have shown you data with bulk of disease with totally exceptional responses. So I do think that we lack data because I have shown 16, he has shown 21. It's Denry Delhaus. And, yeah. and so we, we don't, the basic thing is you have to match the biology of the disease, which is rarely seen in the paper at the moment. We have to match the response to the bridging chemo and then to, to see what are the results. I think it, obviously your question is excellent, what do we do before the car? But I think that we don't know at the moment. There, there have been an abstract that asked comparing, uh, from the Canadian, comparing low dose intensity and high dose intensity uh, on a retrospective way and not on a prospective way prior to CAR and the advantage was on the low intensity chemo because it brings more patient in a more ge good general status than the other. So essentially my, my answer is we don't know and we need more data. Although it has to be emphasized that uh, despite the fact that uh, they are uh, a small number, your patients with uh, negative MRD still remain uh, in mm -hmm. remission, this suggesting that probably in the perspective uh, of uh, the trial run at the academic level by the integral group, uh, having uh, a pre CAR T cell treatment uh, leading to a low tumor burden shouldn't have had the chance of response. Thank you. <laughs>